All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining our seminar series. And um, Thomas, if you'd like to grab the screen sharing, feel free to do that when you'd like. I'm going to stop sharing this one. I'll be able to give an intro too once you have the slides going. Okay, looks good so far. See the PowerPoint view. Okay, perfect. All right, well, thanks again, uh, everyone. So just to uh, pull up some of this text here. Yeah, we're, so we're very pleased to resume our series here. We had a little bit of a break for summertime and now we're jumping right back in with a series on, on waves. And today, so we have Thomas Elsden, uh, who's gonna be presenting on ULF waves. And Thomas completed his PhD in 2016 at the University of St. Andrews in UK on the numerical modeling of ULF waves in Earth's magnetosphere. And he stayed there until 2019 as a postdoc with Andy Wright before taking up a Leverhulme Early Career Fellowship in the Planetary Science Group at the University of Leicester in the UK. So with that, Thomas, we're very pleased to have you today and feel free to take it away. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I hope everyone can, can hear me okay. Um, I'll move my mouse around a little bit. If for some reason you can't see my mouse, please let me know. Um, otherwise I'll be pointing at, at nothing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very nice to be here. Um, I'm very much looking forward to giving this talk on ULF waves. It's a, it's a very, very short title, um, uh, uh, but it encompasses a lot. Um, so let me just get started um, uh, by giving you an outline on what I plan to talk about. I was thinking a lot about how to um, structure this, uh, and I was thinking to begin with, okay, I'll give, I'll do everything on ULF waves. You know, there, there won't be a, a stone left unturned. And then I realised that was probably a terrible idea, given how um, how vast the field actually is. If you don't work in the field of ULF waves, you probably think, oh, we could talk about that and summarise that in ten minutes. Um, but to actually doing anything in any detail, I've realized I've had to be um, somewhat specific about what I talk about. And also realizing that that's, I need to um, talk about the things of which I actually um, have, have some expertise in as well. So I'm going to start by giving a brief historical, somewhat historical background on ULF waves. So what are they? Um, when do they occur? And why are people interested in them? Um, and then I'm going to speak kind of from my own perspective, I guess, on ULF waves as MHD waves. That's where my, my background is. And so just uh, to um, the disclaimer going out there from the start is this is very much a theory and modeling based talk. I realize there's probably a lot of ULF wave observers potentially watching who are um, thinking, ah, oh, you're not mentioning all these great observations and so on. Um, I'll try and do my best, my best to mention some, but uh, it's mostly going to be about the theory and the modeling side. Um, one of the main topics I'm going to be speaking about is fast alpha and MHD wave coupling. This in the magnetosphere is known as field line resonance. Um, and then also talking about the global wave structure of fast modes known as cavity and waveguide modes. Um, all of this first bit should probably take about 30 to 40 minutes, I think. And then I'll throw in at the end just some, uh, uh, some of the stuff in field line resonance that I've been working on myself, just uh, as uh, uh, indulging at the end there. And then at the end, I'll also just list some of the things that I haven't remotely talked about, but are also sort of part of the ULF wave umbrella. Um, I also see this as a bit more of a kind of, I guess, tutorial style, partly on the fast alpha and wave coupling side. So I've put um, some uh, reviews materials at the end, as well as a full reference list for all the references that I'm going to list. So I'm presuming this will be made and um, you'll be able to access the presentation somewhere. If you're interested in reading any more about ULF waves, there should be a resource there for you. So without further ado, like getting into it, um, what are ultra low frequency waves? So simplest way to think of these as just oscillations of Earth's magnetic field um, uh, in this frequency band of a millihertz to a hertz. I'm gonna have these um, uh, this nice schematic here from Ray Town 2007 to go with me through several of the slides, just to kind of pictorially anchor the, the thoughts about, about waves. Um, so these oscillations in Earth's magnetic field were first observed by Stuart in 1861 on the ground, and they were seen as these sinusoidal oscillations in, in the magnetic field. And over 100 years later, after several more observations of this type, um, they were classified by uh, Jacobs et al. in 1964, um, depending on the frequency and also on the form of the wave, whether so into PC for pulsations continuous and PI for pulsations irregular. Um, generally based on was there a nice kind of sinusoidal waveform or was it more irregular? Um, and each of these has its own frequency bands. So for instance, PC5 being the lowest frequency, say from two to seven millihertz, and then increasing frequency from there. Most of what I'll be talking about today will be on the kind of um, the lower end of the frequency range. So we're really talking about large scale, uh, long period waves um, for, for most of what I'll, I'll be uh, discussing. <clears throat> 
Um, the way I like to think of these uh, waves in general is how the Earth's magnetic field responds to changes in its equilibrium. So uh, looking at the picture on the right-hand side here, we can see a schematic of the magnetosphere, solid line being the magnetopause, dash line being uh, the, the bow shock. And um, this system, the Earth's magnetic field is constantly being perturbed by the, uh, the changes in the solar wind dynamic pressure. And so it's responding to these changes, to these um, uh, perturbations, I guess, through uh, ULF waves. And they transfer energy and momentum throughout the, the magnetosphere. And as I said, I'm thinking about these on quite large uh, spatial and temporal scales. So this is what they are. What are ULF waves? Millihertz to hertz oscillations of Earth's magnetic field. And um, why are these of interest? Um, this could be a very, a quite more extensive slide, but I'm just kind of trying to keep it um, short and to the point. First of all, they can um, uh, generate auroral um, displays, and I'll come on to that in a, a lot more detail later on, um, in particular for uh, forward moving auroral arcs, and um, so they can uh, cause the precipitation of electrons into the upper atmosphere. Um, the main thing that's seen this sort of, I guess, I don't want to say regeneration of the field, but certainly since I've been working in, in ULF waves, um, that uh, seems to have popularised the field a lot more, is to do with the interaction of ULF waves with radiation belt particles. Um, and there's just put a few references here. I should say that in any of my reference lists, these are really not exhaustive. These are just some examples of um, uh, studies in these areas. I should also say that with radiation belt particles, that's really the interaction, this wave particle interaction is really not my particular area of expertise. So unfortunately, if you're thinking of coming along today to get to know all about radiation belt ULF wave stuff, that's unfortunately not me. Um, but hopefully I can say a lot about the ULF wave side. And then if you're interested in radiation belts, you can, you can infer the rest. Um, so, uh, but, but that's really sort of um, uh, regenerated a lot of interest in the, in the field in the last 20 years. Um, the other thing would be magnetoseismology. So how can you infer plasma parameters by measuring the frequencies? Um, and this is really powerful because if you've got an array of ground magnetometers, say you can have excellent spatial coverage and you can use frequencies measured on the ground to infer uh, what's going on in space. And there's been some, uh, some really nice studies uh, recently on that, doing it in a statistical way um, to, to infer um, what's going on in the, um, uh, with the plasma density. So these are just some reasons why uh, people are interested in ULF waves. There's also to do with interactions with the ring current and um, in general, ULF waves pervade the entire magnetosphere. So um, they're, they're, they're going to affect a lot of areas of magnetospheric dynamics. Um, and drivers of ULF wave activity. Um, so generally these are split into two different um, bands, you've got those external to the magnetosphere and those internal. So dealing with the external ones, again, my little uh, friend, this figure here, um, to, uh, to, to let us know what we're talking about. Um, so as I mentioned before, changes in the solar wind, so in particular changes in the solar wind dynamic pressure um, uh, impacting the magnetopause are going to generate ultra low frequency waves. So either through the general random buffeting, through um, uh, sort of random um, or broadband perturbations in the solar wind dynamic pressure, or through, for instance, a step change in the dynamic pressure, which hits more as a, a say, a, a southern impulse, um, um, will we'll generate a compressional and uh, ULF wave activity in the magnetosphere. Um, also, the Kelvin-Helmholtz unstable flank magnetopause. So um, that's what's um, been indicated by this figure in particular here, whereby there is a um, the, the velocity shear flow instability on the flanks. Um, can generate surface modes on the magnetospheric boundary, as well as also driving uh, modes which can propagate uh, uh, throughout the magnetosphere. Another um, uh, very interesting um, generation mechanism is actually having a coherent frequency measured in the solar wind. So you could measure um, a coherent frequency, say, in the pressure in the solar wind, and then within the magnetosphere that can be propagated into the magnetosphere and you measure the same frequency. And um, so this is a very, uh, very, interesting, uh, very interesting result. Um, another method being instabilities in the foreshock or um, also day side transients um, uh, in particular things like magnetosphere jets and hot flow anomalies and um, any of these disturbances which create um, a change in the pressure which can um, impinge upon the magnetopause can then launch ultra low frequency waves into uh, into the day side magnetosphere um, and in particular some recent studies which have shown the kind of all elements of the chain where you've you've um, measured the pressure disturbance You've then seen the, the wave in space, and then you've tracked that to the ground as well in a coherent, um, in a coherent way. So this kind of summarizes the external and um, the general external drivers of ULF wave activity. Um, internally, there's, again, more than this, but uh, uh, just to mention that the main, uh, the main thing is really wave particle interactions. 
So in particular, drift bounce resonance. Um, and these tend to be on the, the higher M side. So when I say M, I mean the azimuthal wave number. These tend to have a shorter azimuthal length scale. And I'm not going to go into so much detail on the high M stuff today. Um, it's, again, <laughs> almost a it's an entire talk in its own right to discuss the uh, um, different generation mechanisms for these. So I'll more be focusing on the lower azimuthal wave number, large scale waves today. Um, so I'm sorry if you work on high M waves and we're looking to hear more about that, um, but just to mention it as, a, uh, as another um, uh, important class of ULF wave. So um, to get into kind of what um, more, would, um, more would I do, so ULF waves as MHD waves, as I see that my, my title is hidden by my, uh, my Zoom bar, but that's okay. Um, so again, I've got another little uh, wave schematic on the right to try and um, anchor what we're saying here. So because we're looking at large spatial and temporal scales, um, we can use MHD to uh, look, at, um, uh, look at ULF waves. Obviously, if your scales get smaller, so for instance, in alpha and resonances, which I'll come to discuss, um, the scale sizes can get particularly small and you would need a kinetic description. Um, I won't be talking about that today at all, but um, this is uh, something that you do need to be aware of. But thinking about the MHD system, the cold uh, dayside magnetosphere um, has two modes of, of uh, oscillation. You've got the fast mode, which is um, compressible, and it can propagate in all directions, so it can propagate across magnetic field lines. And in the schematic here, where we can see a sort of cutout of the, the magnetosphere, um, we can see this indicated by the, the lime green or yellow, depending on how your eyes see it, uh, modes which are standing um, on the day side. So they're standing between two boundaries in space, say the magnetopause and an inner boundary, say for instance the plasma pause, there's a significant change in the um, plasma parameters, in, in, in this case the density. And this can act as a place where these modes can be trapped. And that's going to be a, a large thing about uh, that I talk about today. So you've got this fast wave, think of it standing between boundaries or propagating down the tail, um, but crossing field lines. You then have the MHD alpha wave. This is transverse, so the displacement is perpendicular to the field line. Think about a wave on a string. Um, it's a field line mode, so energy propagates along the field line. And um, we can think of this as the, the sort of uh, the labeled field line here as resonant magnetic field line um, with the displacement perpendicular to the, to the field line. So um, these modes are decoupled in a uniform medium. So that's a, a very key point. So the fast and alpha wave, there's no exchange of, of energy between the two modes. However, in a non-uniform case, and the magnetosphere is very much a non-uniform case, um, these, modes, uh, these modes can couple. Um, and that'll be a, a, a big thing about what I talk about today. Um, so just before I get on to the resonance side of things, just to kind of take the historical context then back a step, um, I believe it was Dungey in 1954 who first thought about these pulsations that were being observed on the ground, these long kind of regular sinusoidal periods um, that were being uh, sinusoidal in, uh, pulsations that were being measured on the ground. You could explain these by alpha and waves standing along the uh, geomagnetic field lines. And so I've got a, a nice um, schematic here from a review by Hughes in 1994. I'd really highly recommend this if you're looking to uh, learn a little bit more about the, the history or um, a little bit about ULF waves. This really um, is, a, is, a, is a very, very good review. Um, and um, what they're showing here is uh, the, the fundamental and second harmonic modes along the background field for the toroidal, so that's an azimuthal displacement, and poloidal, so a radial or meridional displacement. Um, and so you can see here that for the fundamental mode, if you assume that the, uh, the dashed lines here are shown, so a displacement in the field line, if you assume that it's anchored in the perfectly conducting ionosphere, um, then you would have a, a maximum at the equator here, a maximum displacement in the second harmonic, that would be a node of zero. Um, and uh, you can see that in the, the poloidal field, how you're um, displacing this field line uh, radially at the equator here. Um, and equally, again, in the second harmonic, it would have a node at the equator. Um, and so this was Dungey's idea as a means to explain these um, sinusoidal oscillations. And this was confirmed observationally, um, in particular by, uh, I think in this paper by Nagata in 1963, where they looked um, uh, at conjugate measurements along either end of the field line and showed that you had a consistent oscillation at either end. So they had conjugate um, uh, magnetometers uh, in order to do that. Um, which confirmed this, this, this concept of, of these alpha waves being um, uh, along geomagnetic field lines. 
Further to that, the um, follow-up works of Cummings in, in, in 1969 were able to calculate the eigenfrequencies, so the natural frequencies of these compared to observations with, with good agreement. And in Samson et al. in 1971, they looked at how what was the latitudinal and um, uh, change of these uh, of these frequencies. Um, and so this leads us into um, uh, what is field line resonance. So there was a, a slight issue with the um, uh, uh, with the, the, the theory as it stood was that they couldn't explain why there were either preferential frequencies or particular locations where the amplitude peaked, you would have expected that if, every, if it was just a consistent change of the frequency with latitude, as you would expect for the field lines getting longer. And so for instance, in this nice little schematic here, that as you go to um, field lines further out, the, the frequencies would just get, uh, would just get lower. Um, but they, they, they saw these um, uh, preferential peaks in the amplitude. And so the, the, the field line resonance theory was a way of explaining that. And so um, I think this is from, uh, uh, um, Andy Wright gave me this figure, I think it's from, um, potentially from his days of um, uh, David Southwood's MHD waves lecture notes. Um, and uh, we're looking at the hydromagnetic wave box model. So we can see we've got the earth here and the uh, day side dipole field lines. If you think about um, uh, essentially straightening out these field lines, so um, you've got your uh, field line foot point anchored in the ionosphere, just straighten that out so that you have the top and bottom boundaries of your box, so your northern and southern ionospheres. Your outer boundary is your magnetopause boundary, inner boundary, some internal reflection point, say for instance, the plasma pause. Um, and then you've got a, a, a box model of, of what the day side magnetosphere looks like. So the problem with this is that you've got now straight field lines and a uniform field. And um, so they all have the same frequency, unless you apply a change in the density in order to achieve a change in the alpha and frequency. So what uh, Southwood did was look at a change in the alpha and frequency across this um, uh, across this box, um, so that the frequencies are lower on field lines further out and uh, higher on these uh, shorter what, what would be shorter removal life uh, field lines. Instead of the linearized low beta MHD equations, the straight background magnetic field, and look for solutions of the following form. So you're just assuming harmonic dependence and um, in time and uh, azimuthal and field line direction but um, spatially uh, varying because of the uh, change in the um, density with the radial direction. And what you end up with is a second order differential equation um, in the, uh, essentially with the X being the dependent direction um, for the compression of magnetic field component, BZ. And there are some key points about this equation, which kind of, uh, the reason that's been written in this form is to, to, to make those stand out. So you can see that in the denominator of this term here in the middle, the, the second term here, you have the fast, alpha, fast wave frequency omega and the alpha and frequency omega a. And so when these two match, there's an alpha and resonance, which is a, it's a singular point of this differential equation. Um, so that's where our resonance is going to occur at the x location where the alpha frequency matches the fast frequency. There's also, you can see in this third term, um, this sort of represents an effective wave number in the, uh, in the, in the equation, um, our radio wave number. And so you can see that if, um, depending upon the sign of this term, you'll change your solutions from um, being oscillatory to evanescent, and by this uh, way, you can define an effective turning point um, where the, the radio wave number is zero. So these things kind of nicely pop out of the maths. However, you can see this far better, far more easily pictorially in some uh, 1D uh, resonance simulations, which I'll show you now. Um, so there are probably some uh, works that I could cite from before this that show the same thing. But I feel like this is the one that I know the best, I guess, and also the one that I think um, shows this pictorially very nicely. So we're thinking about Swan D resonance, this equation we just had on the last slide. How does that, how do these fields actually look? How does that get borne out in reality? And so um, what, uh, what they did in this paper in Manitala 95 was they uh, considered essentially an initial value problem. So you've got, um, the x direction here is their 1D dependent direction. Um, time is the depth of the plot, and they're plotting the energy density here as the, the surface. And you can see that there's a, uh, some mode which exists across the cavity uh, to begin with. So um, that's going to be indicative of your fast mode, which can um, uh, propagate across magnetic field lines. Um, and they, so they start with this initial um, uh, perturbation, and then they just let the system evolve. And what you can see is that this perturbation decays in time fast wave decays at the expense of a growth in the energy density at this particular location. 
Now, if you take a slice across here at different times, you end up with the plot on the right where we're looking at the azimuthal displacement. This is where we're going to expect the alphane perturbation, the field line resonance to show up. Um, remember, alphane wave being a transverse wave. And um, so what we can see is that at early times by the solid line, um, you can see that there's an amplitude peak across this a given location, which um, I'll explain why that location in a minute. Um, and you can see that at a later time, the spatial scale has got smaller in the radial direction, as well as an amplitude increase. And so what's happening here is over time, energy is being transferred from the fast into the alpha wave at the location that the um, natural fast mode of the system, which is going to be a cavity mode in the sense because it's got closed boundaries. Um, so there's fixed boundary conditions here and here. Um, which are uh, uh, giving you a preferred frequency of this fast wave. So if I just flip back a couple of slides, we're thinking about the preferred frequency of these standing modes, these radially standing fast modes, but in a, in a sort of 1D system. Um, that has a preferred frequency, and that will match to an alphane resonance, the alphane frequency at a given location, and that happens to be at, at this location in this, in this simulation. There's also... Um, uh, it's a very information-rich slide, this, I know. Um, there's also a process called alphane wave phase mixing, which is occurring here, which was first realized in, in a solar coronal context by Hebertson and Priest in 1983, um, where essentially you could have, uh, you have, I have no idea if people can see my hands or not, but this is how I usually explain this in a hand wavy way, and I never quite know if it goes across on Zoom. Um, but essentially, you could imagine two, having two field lines which have um, uh, different frequencies, different natural frequencies, say different field line lengths and so on, and as they oscillate, they drift out of, uh, out of phase in time. And really, that's what you're seeing happening in this, uh, in this, this plot um, here, uh, that over time, you're um, generating, uh, I guess you're generating gradients, but uh, uh, sharper gradients over time because these, field, these um, local field lines are drifting out of phase. You can also think of it as the, um, if you've seen the, the YouTube video of the, um, the pendulums, which are all have different lengths, and the, the, the guy takes the board and then lets them all go at the same time. And you see this lovely phase structure as they, um, uh, as they drift out of phase. Um, the, there's an expression for this length scale that forms here, which is the phase mixing length, um, which uh, is dependent upon the inverse of the alpha and frequency. Um, so i.e. how different is the frequency between these two local uh, neighboring field lines. And also this will increase indefinitely in time until you had some dissipation to, to stop this process. Um, and the last thing to mention about here is the key observational kind of observational gold star for field line resonance is that you have an amplitude change as you move across it. So as you move across the structure, the amplitude goes up. And also that if you think about, say, the solid black line is easy to see here on one side of the resonance. Um, you know, sorry, as you move through the resonance, you'll see a phase change of 180 degrees. So you would see, a, say, a negative azimuthal displacement here and a positive one over here. Um, and uh, this I guess I should say so that the width, the overall width here is governed by this, uh, this uh, phase mixing length. Okay, sorry, that was an information dense slide, but I felt it was important to get those, those kind of ideas uh, across. Um, so the nice thing is we've taken this from the 1D, um, essentially 1D uh, field line resonance from Southwood 74, taken the equation there, said, look, here's going to be a singularity, you can have the alpha in resonance, and the fast modes can have this kind of structure. You can then do it in a 1D simulation and see that you get the spatial structure out in the fields exactly as set. And now you can come to the ground magnetometer data and interpret it with that in mind. So here I've got um, some more recent observations um, and I, I could have found um, older ones, but these ones were sort of um, seem to show the pictures like clearly um, from Matthew and Mann 2000 and Ray Town 2005. And the top left-hand panel, I'm plotting the, they're plotting the H component of the magnetic field um, on the ground. And they've identified four different frequencies here. And hopefully what you can see is this, these discrete or uh, these um, individual peaks in, uh, uh, in, each of the, um, uh, in each of the frequencies. So they're each peaking at a different latitude with the lower frequency one, say here, peaking at a higher latitude where the field lengths are longer as expected. And equally across these, there's a phase change of 180 degrees um, uh, as you move across the resonance moving in latitude. Um, same thing can be said in the, in the data and the other example here from, from Ray et al. in 2005. So this is a really nice kind of theory simulation observation um, of, of, of field line resonance. Um, the other thing I said I would come back to um, was the, I mentioned at the start, was about auroral um, 
displays and uh, in particular the forward motion of auroral arcs. So um, here's some uh, a figure um, from Rankin et al in 2005, um, where they're using an all-sky camera, they can see this, this auroral brightening um, which moves forward in time. And then as that um, uh, sort of, uh, this band moves off the top, it's replaced by another one underneath and this circles, uh, cycles in time. If you plot a keyogram of this, so we have time along the bottom, uh, latitude along the uh, y-axis here, you can see the same nice, um, nice forward motion. And so this is consistent with um, the phase structure from field and resonance. And so potentially I didn't quite, um, and I come back to, to this slide, you've probably um, spent long enough looking at anyway, but um, there's a phase motion from high to low frequency associated with these resonances. So if you're at the higher frequency end, that's gonna be usually closer to the planet side on the shorter field line side. Um, essentially the, the Again, if you were to think about these two field lines, you would have a peak in one, and then you'd have a peak in the lower frequency one after. And you can imagine that cascading across the structure, which essentially creates a, uh, um, a phase motion from high to low frequency. Indeed, if you were to have, say, something like a sharp um, uh, uh, plasma pause or something like that, you can actually reverse this because it depends upon the direction of the gradient of the alpha and frequency. So you can have things go the other way as well, um, in which case you would have an equatorward moving um, uh, arc. And it just depends upon the gradient in the alpha frequency. Um, so that's a nice, it's a simple how you can take a 1D model and explain these observational features using it. Um, so one, the, the other aspect of this problem um, is what's driving these things. Um, so I've talked about, okay, I mentioned cavity modes. Um, but one thing that was uh, particularly in the early 90s um, was how do you explain, I guess in the 80s as well, is how do you explain these preferentially observed frequencies. So how could there be particular frequencies that were being observed more than others? Um, and the, the favorite, uh, the, 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 the method that was um, developed for this was this cavity waveguide mode idea. So again, using this figure, we're thinking about fast modes propagating in the day-side magnetosphere, trapped or um, guided by uh, uh, boundaries um, uh, within. So as I said, the cavity mode, um, or maybe I didn't quite explain this already, but the cavity mode would assume that you had, say, like a closed system so that um, you would have a um, discrete azimuthal wave number. So you can imagine having a, a, a mode which exists, say, in an axisymmetric cavity here, and it's closed. A waveguide mode would consider that you could have propagation out to the tail that wouldn't return. So you'd have an open-ended boundary condition allowing for a continuous spectrum of your azimuthal wave number. Um, and there's some really nice studies which developed sort of the mid to late 80s was the real heyday for, or seemingly, um, from certainly from me looking back at it anyway, uh, studying these things, um, particularly the Kibbleson and Southwood papers and, and the nice sort of numerical studies by Lee and Lysak as well. Um, you can find um, in terms of the waveguide modes ideas, um, there's a nice review by Wright and Mann 2006, which goes um, through this in, in really nice detail. You can also find observational examples in Clausen and Hartinger um, in, in these papers here. Um, and it, so the, the idea is that you've got a certain size and shape of this cavity or waveguide that has a preferential fast mode frequency. And that preferential fast mode frequency then drives discrete field line resonances at a given frequency. So that's how you get these um, sort of preferentially observed frequencies. Or well, that was the idea anyway. Um, and maybe just to show you how this might actually work. Um, and again, this is not necessarily the first uh, citation that I could have picked that, did, that does this, but to me, it explains it very, very clearly. Consider uh, an MHD cavity, and um, you're going to drive the outer boundary with some perturbation like this um, in the radial velocity. So this is just a time series of the radial velocity applied as a perturbation to the boundary. Take a fast Fourier transform of that, and you end up with this um, uh, sort of broadband power over a, a given frequency range and then not very much at the higher frequencies. So this is what's supplied on the boundary. You then look at the interior of the cavity. So this is a point within the waveguide. So the equivalent, if I was to show on, on, on this plot here, you're pushing the boundary with some changes in the solar and dynamic pressure, and then your spacecraft is within the magnetospheric interior measuring um, what the fields are doing. And you can see that you have an incredible filtering process that's gone on um, uh, by this Cavity. And then when you take the very transform of that, you can see that you end up with these um, peaks at particular frequencies, which correspond to the 
past the normal modes or the eigen modes of that cavity. And obviously, this is in an idealized system with given boundary conditions and certain simplifications, but it shows that this could be a very effective way that, um, of, of producing these discrete frequencies by having this, um, this filtering process. Um, okay, so um, moving on from that, I wanted to show that um, uh, ULF waves weren't all just 1D models and um, uh, solutions to ordinary differential equations, um, but that some complexity um, can, can very much be, be added in there. And so looking at these in um, global MHD simulations, um, some really nice papers by Paul Pierre et al. in 2010 and 2016, um, looked at using the LFM code to look at uh, uh, ULF waves. And um, so with two different papers, the bottom four plots are from one paper and the top two plots are from a separate paper. Um, and they're looking at the effects of the addition of a plasma sphere in, in the bottom ones. Um, but in the top panel, we can see plotted is the um, uh, power in the radial electric field. We think radial electric field, this is like an azimuthal velocity, so we're thinking line resonance here, or uh, certainly alpha waves. Um, and um, on the right-hand side, we're looking at a meridional um, slice, so we're seeing the, the nodal structure and um, along the field. And what's the simulation is driven by a uh, uh, described condition in the upstream solar wind, which is then propagated through the system. And you can see that you have these um, nice enhancements, uh, as my, if my mouse decides to come back, there it is, um, nice enhancements either side of the moon. You get this interesting structure that you have no field and resonance fields at noon, and that's because it's symmetric about the, the Earth's sun line. And um, it's actually the uh, gradient of the magnetic pressure in this azimuthal direction which drives the resonant response. You could think of field line resonance fields as like the left-hand side of a, as a simple harmonic oscillator, and the right-hand side is this uh, gradient of the magnetic pressure in the uh, azimuthal direction. So because of the symmetry in the system, there's no response there. Anyway, that's, a, that's an aside. Um, you can see that you get these nice um, these nice features either side of Newton. Um, you can also see what happens, so again, in the, in, um, the slightly more recent simulations, uh, again, in the equatorial plane, where we've got the radial electric field that like we had above, and now we've got the electric, the uh, azimuthal electric field on the right. This is very much indicative of the, the fast wave response. And so you can see that when you add the plasma sphere in, you really get a very, because you've changed the density significantly, you've changed the, the equilibrium, you're changing the alpha speed, you really get a very different response as to where your field line resonance structures form and also where the power in the fast mode is, um, which I think is of particular interest to, to those interested in, in uh, radiation belt studies. Um, we can also look at this in a slightly different way by looking at ULF waves, say, in a compressed dipole. Now, this takes a different approach rather than the global MHD model where you're self-consistently setting up the entire system. You can have... Um, uh, essentially, you're, you're looking at the linear MHD equation. So you've got a particular equilibrium, and you're considering small perturbations about that equilibrium, which is the same modeling approach as, as I've taken in my work as well. Um, and so on the left-hand side, this is some results from, uh, from Dredgling et al. in 2010. They have a, a nice model which can look at this in, uh, in a, a, a non-orthogonal coordinate system. So you can do all sorts of weird and wonderful magnetic fields. Um, and uh, on the left-hand side, we're looking at the... Uh, Radial electric field. So um, again, we're thinking of the field and resonant response. On the right hand side, we're looking at the uh, azimuthal um, electric field, so more of the fast mode response. And in these two cases, they've put a, a different location of the fast mode source. So they've, they've created some uh, azimuthal asymmetry in this model. And what you can see is these nice field line resonant structures forming on these on a, uh, a given circular shell. And that shell will correspond to the matching of the, the uh, given imposed fast frequency with the alpha frequency. So really these two cases were just to show that it had, things, have, things have moved on from the sort of the late 80s of simulating um, uh, field line resonances with the computing power that we have now, we can do um, a much more um, comprehensive job um, and, uh, and some, some really nice uh, numerical work here. And given that that's what I do, I have a, a slight bias towards that. So I think I've covered about 30 to 35 minutes just now. Um, so I wanted to just give a brief overview of what I feel like I've said, and um, whether you agree with this or not, <laughs> hopefully some of it's gone in. Start off by giving a general ULF wave background, talked a lot about the historical aspects, alpha wave standing along field lines, um, how these things were first discovered, 
I then looked at how you could treat these things because of the large temporal and spatial scales in terms of MHD. And I looked at building up the complexity of field and resonance from the analytic theory from Southwood into numerical models into what that looks like in observations and how that was used to explain the, uh, the ground magnetometer data. Um, and then I went on to the idea of what's driving the system, these global fast waves of the outer magnetosphere, how they drive these discrete frequency FLRs, and looked at that in theory and um, how that works and also in some, some uh, global simulations. Um, so that's what I feel like I've said so far. For the last 10 minutes or so, I was going to indulge a little bit in some of the work that I've been doing over the last, say, five or six years. Um, I didn't quite know what the... The, um, whether that's, you know, if, if someone comes to give one of these talks, whether they're purely expected to, I don't know, give a, just a general overview about things and not talk about what they do themselves, but I thought it, it would be potentially put some of it in context as to why I've um, kind of built up that introduction into field and resonances based on the work that I do myself. Um, so one thing that I've been looking at in the past uh, sort of five to six years is um, looking at uh, field and resonance in 3D. So really so far, all I've talked about is what happens when you have a, a radial change in the, in the alpha end frequency. What happens when there's a given radial shell? So for instance, if we go back to say here, um, what happens when there's a given radial shell um, where this field line resonance response occurs? Um, and uh, what happens when we introduce some azimuthal asymmetry into this model? Um, so that's the first point. Secondly, um, just bringing back this nice schematic from the review by Hughes in 94, um, something that's interesting about um, alpha waves is that the colloidal and toroidal modes don't have the same frequency, um, certainly for the fundamental case anyway. Um, it's different by about 30 or 40 percent in the uh, in outer magnetic field, and that can vary more drastically if you had a more deformed field structure. Um, and this has been known about for, for over 50 years. The, the, the way, it's a quite a strange thing because the way I think about it is imagine you had a guitar string and you pluck the guitar string, say, out from the guitar. You could think of that as your poloidal oscillation. Um, and if you pluck the string down, like strum the string down, it would be like a toroidal oscillation. They just imagine they had different frequencies. Um, and it occurs because you have um, convergence of the um, magnetic field lines is different in different directions in the azimuthal and radial directions, which leads to this difference in the, uh, in the, in the frequencies. And that also leads to some quite quirky um, behavior of, as to what happens in, in, in field line resonance in 3D. Um, so I'm showing here some simulations uh, that we did uh, back in 2016-17. Um, and um, let me try and explain what we were looking at here. So um, we have a, a, a dipole magnetic field here we're looking down in this bottom panel, bottom left panel, we're looking down in the equatorial plane. The sun would be off to the right, so radial direction, azimuthal direction. We drive the outer boundary with just a, this is just um, monochromatically driven. Um, and uh, uh, the, um, actually it could be broadband driven for this one. Anyway, that's, that's, that's um, by the by for the, the minute. Um, we impose a, a azimuthal variation density. It's the key thing that we do here. So the density is varying azimuthal. You could think about how this might happen in the biomagnetosphere by, say, for instance, a plasmospheric drainage plume on the, on the dusk flank where you have sharp changes in the density. Um, and so what does a field line resonance do now? Um, we can think about out here, there's a given... Um, alpha in frequency based on the density. So given the driving frequency, there will be a particular uh, location which matches the field line resonance condition. Over here, there'll be the density is different. So you've got a different location which matches the alpha in frequency. And it has to change smoothly between here. And we find that you actually have these resonances which follow these curves and these contours of alpha in frequency in space. We also find that the polarization of the resonance of the fields is aligned with these contours. So you no longer have just a toroidal field line resonance. You have something which is in between. So it's some mixture of toroidal and poloidal modes. Um, and so similar results were found in, in Leotow in 2000 and Russell and Wright in 2010. These were for where you had a Cartesian field. So your toroidal and poloidal frequencies, this kind of changing frequencies of your guitar string, if you will, they were the same. Whereas in a dipole, that's not the case. And so in this 3D nature, you've actually now got um, much more complexity added to it than that. Um, and I would go into all the details of that uh, if I had another half an hour, um, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. 
Um, so I'm going to just skip on to what this looks like in a slightly more um, potentially familiar environment, which is looking at uh, this constant of a plume that I mentioned. So on the left-hand side, this is using a, a newer numerical model that we developed. Again, it's linear MHD model, um, uh, and we can apply perturbations locally to this outer boundary, and we can, um, this is looking down the equatorial plane. And here I've put in a particular uh, change in the density in order to get this uh, given change in the alphane speed. And really the only thing that's important for this model is that the, important for the idea of this resonance is the, um, the azimuthal variation. And so you can see when you look at the resulting field line current, we've driven this in a broadband way. And what's happened is these fast modes, that I, uh, uh, these fast waveguide modes that I um, spent so long talking about in the beginning have then coupled to field line resonances. Because there's not one preferred frequency, you get this um, kind of broadband response of the system. So you have resonances across a range of L shells. You can see that on the, the Dawn side, because there's no change in the medium, these resonances just remain on L shells. But because you have a change in the medium on this side, you actually have these resonances which have to follow these contours of alpha and frequency as they change across um, this, uh, this change in the density. Um, and as I said, the polarization is angled along here. So you could think of if I have a satellite, I have a spacecraft that's sitting at this location. You know, you, you could almost be measuring a poloidal wave, but it's actually driven in a sort of kind of low azimuthal wave number um, uh, field line resonance kind of manner. So this um, this intermediate polarization really changes your idea of, of, of poloidal and toroidal and, and, and what their meaning is. Um, and so I've got a little movie here, uh, which is basically from it's a very similar simulation. This is also going to show this outward radial phase motion that would be associated with the equivalent on, in the ionosphere of these um, uh, poleward moving auroral arcs. Uh, and on the right hand side, I'm showing some, some similar, really nice results from Dejling et al. in 2018. Um, I mentioned their model before, where they have a similar plume structure that they put into the model. Um, and uh, uh, what they find is that you can see these. Um, cyan and magenta contours, they're plotting the, uh, this is the radial electric field. Um, and you can see that you have these uh, sort of deformed contours, which are the contours of alpha and constant alpha and frequency. And it's along these contours that you seem to find these enhancements in the radial electric field. And they're very much kind of crossing, uh, crossing L shells and not just sitting at, at one azimuthal location. As I said, sort of questions the interpretation of colloidal and toroidal and, and what they actually mean. Um, uh, so, okay, with that, um, that's pretty much most of what I, I was uh, thinking uh, about saying. Topics I have not covered, so <laughs> I've very much gone to the kind of specifics of fast alpha wave coupling because I felt like it was better to say something more specifically about something and actually get that across rather than just brush over lots of things and not really say anything at all. So I haven't really spoken about ULF wave interaction with radiation bell particles. I haven't spoken about, say, drift bounce resonance and high M. Um, actually, I, I, I wrote a paper last year on, on high M waves, and I hadn't really looked at them too much before. And I was absolutely overwhelmed at how large the literature is in this field alone. It it's really is um, quite phenomenal um, uh, how much has been written about, about these. Surface waves is another thing I've not said anything about at all. And that kind of links in with the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. I haven't looked at anything driven from the night side, so say substorm ejected particles, and that kind of, I guess, links in with the high M stuff. I haven't considered, say, ionospheric effects, ionospheric boundary conditions, interhemispheric asymmetry, connectivities, so on. And I also haven't said anything about planetary ULF wave studies, so that's something I'm quite interested in, is, um, say, looking at field line resonance at Mercury, or what are the natural frequencies of field line of um, alpha and waves, say, at Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and there's quite a lot of research um, active research going, going on into that now. Um, so I went to quite a specific aspect of ULF waves, but just to say, if you thought the ULF waves was a small field, there are all these other um, things out there. Um, just to say another thing that if you wanted to kind of use this as a bit of a, or could potentially use this as a bit of a resource, um, there's some really, really great review articles and books, um, uh, in particular, the uh, Hughes one in 94, McFerrin one in 2005 is great as well. Um, and the, the, in particular for the waveguide modes and um, uh, cavity modes, the right and man one. Um, and there's a nice book as well, actually, on low frequency waves, uh, Healing et al. in 2016, which looks at um, comparing low frequency waves in different environments. So, for instance, at the sun, and also how that then crosses over to, to looking at uh, um, waves at Earth as well. 
Um, so with that, I think I'm going to finish. I should just say I've got full reference list and everything here that you could use and go through. So um, feel free to, uh, to do that if, if you can um, the presentation. But with that, I'll say um, thank you very much for your attention and um, I'll please take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. This is a fantastic presentation, especially I can speak as uh, someone who's a non-expert in wave, uh, wave concepts like this. So I, I really appreciated your uh, visualizations and your structure of the talk. Uh, you were questioning whether or not to you know, include the overview plus your work as well, but you, I think that was perfect. And I, I think the audience agrees. Uh, so with that, yeah, we can transition to some questions here. I'll just mention for those who might need to hop off that, of course, you can continue with our wave theme next week uh, with Haley Allison, who's going to talk about VLF waves in contrast to ULF waves. And here, just coming back to the, some of the questions here. So the first one uh, actually comes back to the information rich slide nine uh, with some of the, um, the wave uh, discussions that you mentioned there. And they say, just an observation, uh, what happens to the peak at x equals one in the left side of the figure? Why is this not reflecting at the right side as well? So maybe it has to do with a boundary condition question or? Uh, yeah, potentially. So um, uh, yeah, okay, I guess two things. Um, the mode, uh, well, it does depend on the boundary conditions. I think the boundary conditions here are perfectly reflecting at the, the interior. Um, so there's gonna be a, a node of the velocity, but this would be an anti-node of the, um, say, compression magnetic field component. But um, it'll also be set up that there's an evanescent decay to this mode. And actually in this 1D system, the, um, uh, the alpha and resonance will be in the um, evanescent tail of the fast mode. So you're going to have some oscillatory region. You're then going to have a turning point, like I mentioned from the equation on the slide previous to this. And then beyond that, it will be evanescent. So um, potentially there's not much mirrored over here because the fast mode, which is what you're seeing here, is uh, evanescent in structure and is decaying significantly by here. There's obviously still enough of the fast wave to drive a significant resonant response. And this is a, a bit of interplay that occurs between um, how evanescent the structure is and sort of where the resonance is in relation to that evanescence, if you will. So is there enough power or amplitude in the fast wave to, to, to drive the resonance still? And um, so that would be my, uh, my guess as to why there's not, you're not seeing much over here. Hopefully that answers okay. that. Yeah, great, thank you. And we're going to the next one. Uh, Kyle was wondering, as you introduce more realistic slash complex magnetospheric configurations, the spatial scale of the ULF waves seems to get smaller. Uh, how does this affect the M number of those waves? Um, yeah, so what's best to say for this? I don't know if you're meaning something like this. Um, yeah, it was, it's, it's, this is what I was sort of trying to say about the complexity of understanding what M uh, means in this sense. Um, Certainly, it's going to affect the, the, the M number, particularly if you have a, a, um, something like a plume here where you could have you can have modes trapped within the plume itself, which are always going to have a, their own kind of N number based on the uh, size and shape of this. And that's also going to affect the, the normal modes, which can form, say, um, in, in, in the rest of the waveguide as well. Um, so, so yeah, definitely including more realistic geometry um, and also the waveguide, not a cavity aspect is also going to, um, going to affect the M number. Um, in terms of, I'm not sure if what was mentioned here is in terms of spatial scales was referring to, to this plot uh, in particular. What you're seeing here are these, um, uh, it's, it's really the process of phase mixing, which has generated these small scales. So similar to, if I just scan back to kind of ground you in the, the 1D theory first, the small scales which are developing here radially, because there's no azimuthal vary, well, there's no azimuthal kind of part of this really, and it's just in 1D, you've got small radial scales based on two field lines drifting out of phase uh, in time, as it, uh, according to this sort of 1D phase mixing length idea. In 3D, when you have a 3D variation in the alpha speed and the alpha frequency, you've no longer got this kind of coherent direction of where phase mixing is occurring. And these phase mixing ridges, if you will, are actually at an inclined angle. And because of that, that's, it's quite, how would you define an M for that? You know, you could measure in the azimuthal direction, you could count peak to peak here, and that might give you a particular M number for the, um, uh, for the field line resonance response. But that would be very different to what the kind of global mode wave structure is as well. So um, yeah, this, this, these azimuthal changes in the density really do kind of change the interpretation of what M means, I guess, if that answers that. 
Yeah, very interesting. And feel free, Kyle, if you want to jump in for a follow up uh, afterward as well. But uh, so with here, a couple more questions still rolling in. Uh, so we have Ankush who's wondering, uh, what is the damping time for ULF waves across these different L shells, which might segue in off of this plot as well? Yeah, so the, the um, okay, so there's a, there's a few, few aspects in here. And um, yeah, back to the, the favorite model. Um, uh, sorry, were you saying that was referring to that other plot as well? Uh, not, necess not necessarily, no. uh, but yeah, feel free okay. to take it where you think it would be best. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the damping can be caused by a couple of things. So once, first of all, you've got a driver in the system, which is going to be the fast wave, which initially sets up the, um, uh, the alpha in resonance, and then that alpha in resonance is going to decay based on um, most likely uh, dumping its energy into the, uh, into the ionosphere. Um, so depending on, and that would, that would then link into to this term as well for the phase mixing length, which will limit the width of this resonance. Um, and so the, the larger the dissipation, the, um, the broader this resonance width um, and uh, uh, the, in the steady state that it, could, that it could get down to, you could think of it as the amount of energy you're putting into the resonance is then being dissipated. So it can't actually narrow uh, any further. In terms of the simulation that we had before, we just have in the simulation, we just have a, a, a uniform resistivity. We don't have a, a damping which is dependent upon latitude in this sense. In reality, you would have to take into account different ionospheric conductivities, which would then affect the damping rate locally. But that's not something I know particularly a lot about in terms of realistic conductivity pro profiles. Um, I know that that's a, a quite an active area of research, but it's not something I particularly know too much about. So I'll just basically leave it there and say that in the simulation, it's uniform. So the, the damping is, it, the resistivity that we use is uniform. So there's, there's not, um, uh, or uniform um, uh, latitudinally, I should say. So um, uh, there's not a difference in the damping based on, on, on that. I think that's, uh, that's correct to say. So hopefully that answers the question. There. Yeah, great. I think that is a good job of it. And let's see, so next, uh, Dong Lin was wondering, uh, can you elaborate on how PMAAs, and that is poleward moving auroral arcs, uh, are driven by these fid line resonances? Uh, are they precipitating electrons, or are the precipitating electrons accelerated by wave fields or scattered with wave modulation? Um, I'm going to say that's not something that I know uh, very much about um, at all. I'm going to go back to, uh, back to here. The actual sort of kinetic processes which go on in terms of the waves driving the electrons um, is uh, not something I, I, I know too much about. I know that from the field line resonance on the kind of large scale wave aspect, um, I know that you have these, you basically have significant field line currents which are generated from, from these waves. Um, and I'm guessing that if you have, yeah, you're, you're, you're uh, in a um, upward current region, you'd have thermal precipitating electrons in that, but I don't want to say too much more about it than that because it's really not my, my area of expertise. I'm sure there's um, potentially participants on the call who could say a lot more with a lot more authority about it than that, but I don't want to, to, to kind of speak out of turn on something that really isn't, isn't my area. So um, apart from having the field line currents generated from the, um, uh, from the MHD waves, um, I'm not going to say too much more about that in terms of the uh, electron acceleration, hopefully that's that's okay there. Sure. You, know, you have to be yeah. honest about what you do and don't know. <laughs> That's true. That's, that makes sense. So, all right. So then we have another follow-up from uh, Bizwaji, I believe. Uh, slide 19. Uh, in your 3D model, what spatial separation of the spacecraft would you expect to measure uh, the dips and enhancements of those currents simultaneously? Uh, fantastic question. And something we're, we're very much currently thinking about. Um, so it'll depend a lot upon... Um, uh, Okay, well, there's, there's two things. We're thinking about whether we can see this on the ground, first of all, and then also whether you can, how you would actually measure it in space. Um, it's also how long lasting is this versus how the spacecraft is moving through it. Um, depending on, um, uh, it also massively depends on sort of how abrupt this boundary is. I think in, in general, in data, the plume crossing is quite a, a clearly observable feature, clearly um, uh, sort of uh, very quick change in the density which would mean that you would, should see something similar to this. Um, but it really depends on what sort of spatial scale that is. If, for instance, you saw um, you had a, a spacecraft at, at one particular L shell here, 
and it flies through and it sees a resonance on this side, but nothing on the other side. Or if you had two, say, radially separated spacecraft that could go through and one um, sees a one frequency and then the other one picks up that same frequency later on, um, as in you've got one frequency, uh, one spacecraft sitting on this curve and then the other spacecraft picks up that curve in here. Um, uh, but yeah, th th there's, you, would, you would certainly need a couple of spacecraft to, to do it. In terms of spatial separation, it all depends about how quickly this, um, how thick this transition is, I guess. Um, and then on the ground, you would hope that um, when we were looking at doing this, excuse me, um, is to look at if you could have good longitudinal coverage and you could say do it statistically looking at over times where you think there's a plume there. Could you show some statistical bias to the frequencies based on when the plume is there and also on the polarizations? So in plume times, do you see a lot more of these intermediate polarizations as in a mixture of toroidal and poloidal than you would in, um, uh, uh, than you would in say, non-storm uh, or non-plume times? Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to think about lots of innovative ways of how we can extract these kind of things from the data. Um, and maybe it'll all just turn out to be a big mess and you can see them perfectly in simulations, but you can never um, extract them with enough confidence. But I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful. They're a fairly robust, you know, you have a change in the, the density, you have to have a change in the resonance location um, and, and, and then polarization like this. So they're a pretty reasonable, a pretty um, robust feature of the physics. And so hopefully that's borne out in a somewhat observable way. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, that'll be nice to see the sort of spacecraft observation complement to these. So there's uh, pretty good structures. So, uh, all right. So then also it looks like we have another, maybe last one here for now, since we're at the top of the hour. Uh, Anthony Chen is asking a question for a friend. Uh, first of all, thank you. Very nice talk. And that echoes, I think, many of the, uh, the sentiment from the audience. And, and he says, you discussed fast waves and alphane waves, but what about slow waves? Uh, are they less important or are they not important? Uh, so I'll leave that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, something I've always thought about and wondered about, but never done anything about. Um, it's, it's one of those things where you um, you kind of get into a field and you read a lot about it and everyone just says, oh, well, it's a cold plasma and we just neglect the fact that there's any pressure gradient and therefore we get rid of our slow modes. And so in a pure MHD description of a cold plasma in a low beta, your grad P term and your equation of motion just disappears. Um, and this dispenses with slow modes. So it's not something I've ever looked at. I'll be entirely honest with you about that. I have seen a couple of older papers which consider what the effect of slow modes are, but we don't have them in our simulations purely by the fact it's a low beta approximation. Um, although in parts of the magnetosphere where that's potentially not so, um, so say uh, uh, moving further out uh, onto the flanks as the, um, uh, as the magnetic field strength decreases, it could be that, that these become important, but I honestly don't know. But something I've always thought about and never done anything about it. So um, interesting question. If anyone um, wants to hop in on that, I'd be more than happy to hear about the importance or otherwise lack of importance of slow modes. I'm sure I'm sure there's some reason why someone they're not more talked about, but maybe that maybe they are, and I just don't know. But that's my my honest answer on that one. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, great. And thank you for, for those replies. And yeah, certainly interesting trying to look at various regimes, you know, where we turn turn the knobs and, you know, select certain certain physics, like in this case, like you said, the gradients are kind of aren't, aren't there in that case for the, the pressure gradients. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, with that, I just want to thank you. Thank you again very much, of course, to our uh, to our speaker, Dr. Thomas uh, Elson and uh, other people in the chat, of course, are leaving comments there. And, and thank you to the audience for, for tuning in for another another weekly seminar series. And we hope to uh, hope to see you next week as well as we continue uh, thinking about waves in the magnetosphere. All right, thanks Thank you again. Much, yeah, thanks again, great talk. Uh, hi, Tom. <laughs> hi. Um,